All right, so I've just begun the recording, as I already mentioned, and as you can probably hear a little bit so far, my throat is not doing too well. <laughs> but hopefully we can get through this Bible study. I got a nice glass of water with me. But today, we're going to be getting through some of the first steps to the Ordo Salutis. And the Ordo Salutis, let me just write it down so you know how to spell it because it's Latin and might be a little confusing. The Ordo Salutis stands for Order of Salvation. And it's the idea that there is a certain order to salvation where you have a number of these distinct parts and aspects of salvation. So for instance, you could have justification in that order. You could have sanctification, maybe the calling of God, regeneration, and so on and so forth. So there's a certain order to salvation. We saw that it wasn't necessarily, and probably isn't, unless you're talking about the really last step, which is glorification, which happens in the end times, but it's not really chronological. There are a number of parts that just pretty much all go together, right? So if you are regenerated, then you've been born again, you've been brought to new life by the Holy Spirit, and you will have as a result of that regeneration, faith and repentance. We'll see that some people kind of switch the order a little bit, but you will have faith and repentance from that regeneration pretty much immediately in most cases. And along with that, once you have been regenerated, once you have been converted and sanctified and you've been brought into the Christian life, then immediately you will be persevering in that Christian life. So people include perseverance in the Ordo Salutis. So here is an example of what the Ordo Salutis could look like. Some people disagree on the order, but this is what Louis Burkhoff makes the order out to be. So it starts with God's calling, and then regeneration, you've been born again, and then conversion, which includes faith and repentance, and justification, sanctification, perseverance, and glorification. Just keep in mind that this is not really a chronological order of salvation. It's more of just a bunch of different aspects. Some are linked together. Some just go together immediately. So don't get too caught up in thinking of these as all separate steps. Though you can think of the first and the last step as fairly separate. So, you know, even before you're saved and regenerated necessarily, you have been called by God. And finally, in the end times, after Judgment Day and so on, or pretty much during, maybe before, <laughs> you've been brought to new life in glorification, given a new body, resurrected body, if you are a Christian, that will not perish and not be thrown into hell. And it will be, not have all the, the problems that, that we do today when God makes the new heaven and the new earth. And everything involved in that. But we'll look into that in more detail. I'll just give you the quick summary. So that's what we'll be looking at today. Calling and regeneration. So just keep in mind, we're just looking at different aspects of salvation. Not necessarily separate steps, or especially not all chronological steps either. So when we're looking at the calling of God, we basically have two different kinds of calling. We have an external calling, and we have an internal calling. Now, there are a couple different kinds of external callings, which we'll get into as well. So with external callings, you can take a look at nature. You can look around you and see creation. And as Romans chapter 1 says, we can see the invisible attributes of God, namely his ultimate power and deity. When you look at creation, look at the stars, you look at the trees, you look at the massive expanse and everything like that, you get that external calling from nature where you can see the deity of God, even though people suppress that knowledge, as Romans chapter 1 says. So the second kind of external calling is the gospel calling. You're walking around, there's a preacher on the street, He's preaching the gospel. You've been externally called through hearing the gospel. Something outside of you, you're hearing that. Or you're just in church and you, you hear the gospel there. Especially if you're not a Christian, that's what we're looking at. People who are not Christians, 
they are the ones who are the focus of this external calling. So if you want some fancy terms for these, <laughs> let me just switch the order around. Verbalis. So here are the fancy terms. Vocatio realis, which is the external calling of nature. You can think of it as reality, realis, nature, creation, things like that. And vocatio is the calling. Vocatio realis. And then you have the vocatio verbalis, which is the gospel calling through words. So those are your fancy terms if you want to remember it that way. So that's the external calling. And the internal calling, on the other hand, of course, is the inner witness of the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit is explicitly working in that person and to call them. And that's the internal call. And some people think that this internal calling is irresistible on the Calvinist side. Some people think it's resistible on the Armenian side. And the internal calling is related to regeneration. It's not necessarily the same thing. We're going to make a distinction there. Some people don't make the distinction, but it's not really the same thing. But it's definitely related to regeneration. So, any questions so far? I see a couple people typing. B says it's essential for weekly faithful preaching of the word from the pulpit. I would definitely agree with that. Both for believers and non-believers, of course. Hmm. Yeah, and it's worth also noting that some people equate the internal calling with the effectual calling of the Holy Spirit. And some people don't do that. <laughs> they have a couple different kinds of internal callings. Yeah, I mean, that's a good thing. I only got close to God in quarantine when I really heard more about God. Yeah, that's fine. Some people do slow start. Or they are slow starters, I should say. Some people do start slow. Other people, it's a little more instantaneous, depending. But we'll actually talk a little bit about that when we talk about regeneration. But for now, we're actually going to focus on one types of one of the types of these callings. Because we've talked about two types of external callings. Vocatio realis, call from nature, creation. And vocatio verbalis, the external calling of the gospel. And then we've also talked about the internal call. But for now, we're going to talk about vocatio verbalis, the gospel call. So let's go ahead and define this real quick then. The gospel call can be defined as follows. The offering of salvation in Christ to people, together with an invitation to accept Christ in repentance and faith in order that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. So if we define it like that, and I think it's a good definition, you can disagree with that if you want, but we have a couple different steps here, which are kind of necessary. And just because I'm a little under the weather, maybe you guys could read some of these verses real quick. So we have a couple verses there. The first one didn't pop up though. There we go. So we have three points in this definition. Number one, the gospel call is a presentation of the facts of the gospel and of the way of salvation. Point number two, it's an invitation to come to Christ in repentance and faith. And point number three, a promise of forgiveness and salvation. These points not only are evidenced in the couple verses here, but they're also evidenced in the different sermons that we see especially in the book of Acts. If you take a look at Stephen's sermon, uh, Peter's sermon, a number of Paul's sermons, they usually include these as some of the main points here. So I need a volunteer to read those two verses there. I can. Whenever you're ready. 1 Corinthians 23-24 to But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a cause for stumbling, but to the Gentiles foolishness, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Matthew 11:28. Come to me, all of you who labor and are burdened, and I will give you rest. Wonderful, thanks. So the first point there was from 1 Corinthians 1, 23-24. We see a number of these different facts about the gospel 
and we see even more facts if we read more sermons and you know very important facts things like the basis in Romans 10:9 confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead so facts are included in the gospel presentation and thus they have to be included if you're looking at a gospel call but of course facts can be resisted and they often are people suppress the truth and even de even demons you know they believe the facts and they know the facts probably better than we do most of the time so that can be resisted i don't think anyone disagrees that the gospel call can be resisted it's not completely effectual to salvation armenians i'm pretty sure they agree that the gospel call can be resisted calvinists i'm sure they believe that the gospel call can be resisted as well so just keep that in mind it's a presentation of facts and it's an invitation as well it's all external too so it can be easily resisted so any questions on that so far yeah that's a great illustration there and we can see that in our own you know just natural experience it's easy to resist the gospel call and you also see that in the bible too many examples of people who have heard the gospel and rejected it fairly easily a lot of examples in acts examples from jesus preaching even and all that so i have a couple questions first if someone may be wandering be against since you already volunteered can you read these verses real quick from romans or <clears throat> romans 10 13 to 15 for everyone who calls upon the name of the lord will be saved how then will they call upon him in whom they have not believed and how will they believe in him about whom they have not heard and how will they hear about him without one who preaches to them and how will they preach unless they are sent just as it is written how timely are the feet of those who bring good news of good things romans ten seventeen. consequently faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word about christ wonderful thanks so a few verses there and fairly rhetorical questions how how will they call on the that person who they have not believed and who have they not heard and who they haven't heard preached either so my question then regarding all these verses can people come to salvation without the gospel call what do you guys think all right hat says yes could you give some some ways that could happen how would someone come to salvation without the gospel call yep so b is making a distinction there and it's a distinction that we made before so that's really good so she says if you're talking about natural theology itself and that's a big no so that would be vocatio realis so we're talking about the witness of nature so if we're just talking about the witness of nature and not the vocatio verbalis the gospel calling then b says then no that person can't come to salvation so nat says yes it's possible to come to salvation without a gospel call so hat says for example if jesus appeared to someone in a dream and i think we do have you know, biblical examples of that as well arkin wolf says you know maybe this person was preaching the gospel maybe he wasn't perhaps the full gospel so so far i don't think anyone has argued for vocatio realis yet as a way for salvation vocatio realis itself but hat has brought up a supernatural event where jesus himself appears in a dream to someone i mean i'm not gonna advocate for vocatio realis because every single person's mind is totally depraved and you can't really reason your way towards jesus because there are always his enemies before we're renewed and regenerated hmm that's a really good point too so if we go back to one of our previous studies <laughs> a while ago we talked about total depravity the total inability of man in and of himself to come to god 
And Nat says, I think I told the story already, but God spoke directly to my grandfather and he was converted. My grandmother also heard the voice of God asking her where she'd be if he came today. So yeah, those are pretty good examples. And I still don't think anyone has argued for vocatio realis yet, the witness of nature itself. But rather, you know, there are supernatural events. And perhaps in these supernatural events, Jesus can, you know, give someone the gospel, either through words or through some other means. But that's a possibility as well. It's also possible with these examples, perhaps, that maybe we skip the external calling of the gospel itself and we move right into the internal calling. Then we'll actually, we'll get to that pretty quickly talk about the internal calling next, but just keep in mind that the gospel calling itself can be rejected. No one, I don't think anyone disagrees <laughs> with that, but the person by itself, without any sort of internal calling, the person himself is totally depraved and totally unable to come to God by himself. Yes, vocatio realis is by observing the world it's the calling through seeing nature. And let me just bring up the verse for that real quick. Just so we're all on the same page. So Romans 1.20 For from the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, both his eternal power and deity, are discerned clearly being understood in the things created, so that they are without excuse. So that's where we get the idea of an external vocatio realis calling. We look at creation and we see the deity and power of God. Though later on in that same chapter, it says that the, those people who observe creation, they suppress the truth in their heart of heart. And we also see that rather than giving them a certain opportunity for salvation, the focus of Romans chapter 1 there, and even chapter 2, the focus there is on their condemnation. So the last part of that verse, so they are without excuse. It doesn't say anything about them coming to salvation. Rather, they are held accountable for seeing some of the invisible attributes of God and yet still rejecting him. That's what man does in his natural state, according to Romans 3. 10 to 12. There's no one who's good, no one righteous, and no one who seeks God. So Had asks, you think then that's where it starts for some, then God could either supernaturally bring or use a human to bring the gospel to them. I think that's definitely a possibility there. Someone could also say that within the, the supernatural, <laughs> supernatural act of God, there is the gospel that's declared to that person in some fashion. Right? They might not have every single little detail of the gospel, but perhaps the essential parts. And perhaps it's not verbally stated either, but you know they get the essential parts of the gospel, even if it's not verbally stated in the supernatural event. They see and witness and experience for themselves that God is God. Yeah, it was Paul who who preached about their unknown God. He used that as a cultural example there. Yeah, and that's another good point that Nicole made. I doubt God, but when I see my surroundings, I realize that God is God. The vocatio realis, even if it might not be effective for salvation, it can still be effective for affirming someone's salvation and being one of the points that helps lead that person to Christ. Right? Been, you can have all the facts about the natural world and still not be saved, of course. That just, <laughs> just, just won't save you. And even if you did have all the facts that you can observe right now, you won't have certain facts that are essential to salvation, like how Christ died and rose again, for instance. You still need a little more. So, which that, that all leads us to. And of course, some people disagree with that. Um, some theologians and some Armenians say that you actually can you actually can come to salvation just through natural revelation, just through vocatio realis with your natural self, because they ignore or 
kind of get around total depravity. So they might ignore total depravity and say that man is able in his natural ability to come to salvation. So he doesn't need a gospel call. He doesn't need an inward call, internal call. He just needs to, you know, come to God by his own free will. Or if you do affirm total depravity, some Armenians posit prevenient grace, where God elevates and frees that person's will from total depravity, elevates them to the point where they can accept God, even through just natural revelation. So that's definitely a thing as well. So that leads us to the next question, <laughs> where if someone can't actually come to God without the gospel calling, and of course the inner calling as well, you, you need that too, but if you can not come to God without the gospel calling, and you know you can look at Romans 10, 13 to 15, how can someone come to salvation if they haven't heard the gospel? Okay, what about those people who don't hear the gospel? Maybe some person in some you know, tribe in Africa that hasn't been reached yet who hasn't heard the gospel. What about that person? If hearing the gospel is necessary for salvation, what about them? You know, feel free to use your microphones if you want. <laughs> Typing's okay too. <laughs> That's all right. That's a proper excuse. All right. So this once I watched uh, something when someone asked a question on what happens to those who haven't heard the gospel. Like, are uh, others sa are they saved when they die and they never heard of Jesus? So, um, what I've heard is that they're like uh, presumed as innocent because they never heard the gospel and therefore they can't really be considered guilty because they don't know um, sin. I guess. Uh, but at the same time, I sort of disagree because. Everyone has sinned, so either way, they're guilty, and they could still be saved. I just said two sides that I heard of, but yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. So the first thing that you talked about was, well, if someone hasn't heard the gospel at all, maybe they, you know, get a free pass, <laughs> or something like that. And in Roman Catholic theology, and you know, other people use this, other denominations, but they call it invincible ignorance. So if someone really didn't have any way to be saved, they didn't have any access to a church perhaps, they didn't have any access to a Bible or any access to God, or this would also include infants, right? It would also include infants who just couldn't get to the knowledge of the Savior, Jesus Christ. And it also talks about, you know, maybe people who are terribly mentally ill and so on. And they... If, you know, they really couldn't get there with a reasonable measure of effort, if they really couldn't come to salvation with a reasonable amount of effort, then they are invincibly ignorant and, you know, they get, kind of get a free pass. <laughs> it's a big simplification, but they, they pretty much get a free pass. That's one way that people give as an option for the people who haven't heard the gospel. And the other option that you, you said would be, Actually, I, I think I forgot already, <laughs> but you, you disagreed with that anyway and say, and say, okay, I remember now. Yeah, and I like that point. You said, well, even if they couldn't get to Jesus Christ, they're still held accountable for their sin. And I think that's the option that best accords with what we see in Romans. Though perhaps there are some people in specific situations that might get a free pass. What we do see in Romans is that people are held accountable for their sin, right? If you can just look out and see the natural world in creation, then you are without excuse, as Romans one twenty says. In Romans chapter 2, we see that the moral law is written on our hearts, and we see this you know, moral conscience that testifies against us, and maybe for us, but usually against us, because if you sin, then you are held accountable for that, because you know what you've done was wrong. So Smiley Fry says, There would definitely have to be some sort of gospel being spoken there because they have never heard of God. There can be some cases where they can have something supernatural. So perhaps the gospel calling is more universal than we thought, right? Maybe in the, even those tribes that haven't been reached, they still have some form of gospel calling. That's another answer that people give. Or maybe that wasn't his answer because he misinterpreted it. That's okay. Okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's fine, no worries. So Nat asks, perhaps, do you think they could possibly get a chance after death? People who never heard the gospel and never had a way to. And that's yet another answer that, that people gave. I'm glad we're getting all these different answers because people do give a big variety of answers. So perhaps they do have a chance after death. And that's an answer that people give. I personally don't agree with that. I don't think there's any evidence in scripture that you know we hear about that. What we do see in scripture is that it's appointed for one person to die die once, and then judgment. We don't really hear about a second chance or anything like that. So Fluffy asks, doesn't God judge them by what law they follow? And I would say that we all have the universal moral law written on our hearts, and someone sins once, you know, they're judged to condemnation. So Arkenwolf asks, says her that infants cannot sin until they have knowledge of sin and that's generally what people call at least a form of the age of accountability so there's a specific age and that might differ from person to person depending on how fast they mature of course so perhaps they have a specific age for an infant where once they get to that age then they can be held accountable for their sin but before that you know they're just not held accountable for it because they you know they are in a sense, invincibly ignorant of sin. They're not mature enough to be held accountable for it. And that's another option that people take. <laughs> so I'll give you guys a couple options as well, some of the major options. So on the Calvinist side, you know, strong on God's predestination and sovereign will, and on man's moral responsibility too, on the Calvinist side, they would say, well, those unreached people groups and tribes they were simply destined for hell. God didn't cho God just didn't choose them to be elect. He just chose to let them be in their sin. He chose to give them over to their sin. And the fact that they didn't have an opportunity for salvation just means that they were chosen for damnation. So that's an option that some people take. Another option is, I guess, the Molinist side or at least the William Lane Craig option. So William Lane Craig is a Molinist, and you don't really need to know what that is because it's a little confusing. I won't explain it right now. But he kind of gives the option that, well, perhaps all of these people who are unreached and haven't heard the gospel and didn't have an opportunity, perhaps those people just wouldn't have accepted the gospel anyway, even if they did have the opportunity. So that's another option. They just wouldn't have accepted the gospel anyway. So it doesn't really matter <laughs> if they're in a place that has access to the gospel or not. So Arkenwolf says, I know that a bit. I think it was something Jesus talked about. Well, actually, that's Smiley Fries. One instance where a man had went to hell and wanted to have a second chance and to tell his family about God, but God wouldn't let him. That's definitely a great example for that. Specifically, though, we're talking about Hades, or Sheol in Hebrew, but we're talking about Hades, not the hellfire that we think of today. But it's the kind of interim waiting room, Hades. You're still punished there for non-believers. But Hades is there until, you know, God you know, makes all things, you know, he brings about the lake of fire and he throws Satan and his cronies and the non-believers into hell. It's called Gehenna. That's the place we think of with, with hellfire. That's, of course, found in Revelation. So he was actually thrown in Hades there for the rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus was, you know, the other side in paradise. So yeah, we don't see a second chance in that parable. I don't know if there is a second chance, but we don't have any evidence of one, I don't think. It seems that the evidence, like that parable, would kind of militate against a second chance. So Nat says, I guess that's why the Bible says we should go out and preach the gospel, so that way everyone gets a chance to hear it, which is where missionaries would come in, etc. Yeah, I mean, the fact that there is no second chance, <clears throat> that we are talking about eternal life or eternal damnation, should definitely spur us on heavily in preaching the gospel to people and 
doing everything we can to bring people to the gospel. But on the other hand as well, we're also, we also have to look at moral responsibility, right? Someone is morally responsible for their sin, and if they go to hell because of their sin, they're morally responsible to the, for that, and we don't have to beat ourselves up to no end because of that. They're morally responsible for the actions that they take and the choices that they make. Yeah, that was one of the last verses of that parable, Fluffy. And the point there was that the rich man was begging begging Abraham and God to send Lazarus to his brothers so that they would believe in someone who rose from the dead. But the the point that was the retort given to the rich man was that you know, they have the prophets, they have Moses, but if they don't even listen to them, neither would they believe someone who is risen from the dead. So there is a point where even through miracles, you just can't bring someone to salvation, right? You shouldn't beat yourself up too much about that. But, you know, if you're not doing much <laughs> about the gospel and, you know, proclaiming the gospel to people and evangelizing, well, then you can beat yourself out, up about that. But there, there does come a point where even miracles aren't going to bring someone to salvation. So that's another good thing to remember. And finally, I just want to bring up one last point about people who haven't heard the gospel who didn't have, even have a chance for salvation, perhaps. <clears throat> Frank Turek brings up a great illustration where he talks about, okay, the question of, well, if God didn't even give them the chance for salvation, isn't that unjust? Frank Turek gives up the great example of, let's say there is this terminally ill man and he's got this fatal disease that will kill him unless he gets to the doctor's office, right? It'll kill him unless he gets to the doctor's office, but he was born in some random tribe and he couldn't get to the doctor's office at all. And the question then is, that man dies then, okay, what actually killed him? Did the disease kill him or did the fact that he didn't get to the doctor's office kill him? It was the disease that killed him, right? And if we tie that in with moral responsibility, let's say that ma that man did something horribly wrong to warrant and to get that disease, <laughs> that fatal disease in himself. And that person did something that he could be held morally responsible for in getting that disease. And then I think you have a pretty good illustration of what happens. And for infants, you know, we have a number of explanations. You could talk about invincible ignorance an age of accountability. You could also talk about a passage like Romans 5.12 and the other passages around there. Because of this, just as sin entered into the world through one man and death through sin, so also death spread to all people because all sinned. So, you know, I usually go with the idea that somehow, either spiritually or representatively, even infants have sinned in Adam in such a way that they could be held accountable for Adam's sin. And I think this is the best explanation that accounts for infants being able to die in the womb, infants being born into a sinful world and being subject to sin, even though, you know, they're you probably can't talk about a fetus sinning exactly, or even from conception, immediate conception probably hasn't sinned. But that fact that they've been born into a broken world, that they can die even in the womb before then, I think is evidence that death has spread to them and because they've sinned in some fashion, spiritually in Adam before, you know, well, actually, when they fell, and so on and so forth, before all this stuff, thousands of years ago. So in some fashion, either representatively or spiritually. So that's another idea that people have. <laughs> so Arkenwolf asks, By the way, I want to say that we can't assume God's righteousness. Our hearts are still twisted, so we can't always say, Well, God wouldn't do that. That's a, that's a great question. I would say that we can trust in God's righteousness based on the witness of the Bible, based on the things that he's done already. But I would say that we, not just our hearts being twisted, but more than that, it's that we just 
Well, yeah, I, I guess it kind of falls into our hearts being twisted. But even more than that, it's just of our, our finiteness and our lack of knowing exactly what God is doing. We just don't know, right? God might have morally sufficient reason for doing all the things that he does. So I would say that we, we just can't know that exactly, what morally sufficient reason God would have in allowing death to come to people and allowing sin to come into the world and so on and so forth. Of course, we have explanations, right? But, you know, they're more of guesses and speculations. So, for ex instance, why did God permit evil to come in the world? Why didn't he just make a perfect world? I would say perhaps God did it this way because it would perhaps glorify him more. With a sinful world, he could exercise judgment, mercy, all of those wonderful offices of God. He could exercise greater love for enemies rather than for people who already love him. Right? It, it takes a greater love to love your enemies. So God wouldn't be able to exercise any of that or be show his full majesty through those wonderful offices of his, like judge, the office of judge, the office of mercy, and so on and so forth. So perhaps that's one of the reasons why he created a world that fell into sin rather than a world that remained perfectly sinless. And other people have different, <laughs> different answers too. But we should all you know, remember that we are finite beings. I do think that's the best explanation, though, for his glory. All right. So any final questions before we move on, then? Actually, we pretty much covered the time. I think we'll keep the internal calling and regeneration for next week. I don't think the, the external callings would take this long, but hey, I think we spent some good time here. So Nat asks... Would you say that perhaps he also wanted us to choose him of our own will? That's the option that most free willists take, especially libertarian free will. So God created a world that could fall into sin because he wanted us to be free to choose him or to choose sin. The issue with that, of course, is couldn't have God created a completely free world that actually remained perfect and didn't fall like it did. And some people say no. Some people say yes. It, perhaps that is possible. If we look at heaven, for instance, the people in heaven are completely and perfectly free, but they, you know, they won't sin. <laughs> are they truly free to choose sin? Some people would say yes. Some people would say no. So yeah, we, we got a number of options there. So Fluffy says, angels fell though? Yeah, angels did fall. How did they fall? Did they also have the same free will? And couldn't God have made a world that didn't fall, <laughs> even though they were free? Of course, even on the, on the free will side, you could still take the glory route. And it was for God's glory that he chose to create a world that would fall. A world that was perfectly free that would fall, rather than a world that was perfectly free that remained in perfection. It was for his glory that they would fall, so that he could exercise mercy and judgment and greater love and so on. So it is a tough question, but I do think that there are many solid answers within Christianity. Not all of them are necessarily exclusive. In apologetics, this problem is called the problem of evil. Why is there evil in the world if there is a good God? That's usually the, the question asked. But I do think that we have very solid answers for that. We have some solid real answers right now that we can actually bring up. And we also have an answer that, well, we just don't know why exactly God would do that. And we can't have perfect knowledge of why he would do that either. Now take care, smiley fries. So Hat asks, best resources to answer the problem of evil? You can link them after, of course. Well, there's a lot of great answers, and it also kind of depends on your theological bent. The answers that Armenians give would have, you know, would be different than the answers that Calvinists would give. On the Calvinist side, there's an entire book, I think, called something about the problem of evil and Calvinism. <laughs> 
There's an entire book on that that I would recommend. Some other options, I, I don't have any books off the top of my head, but there are a lot of great apologists out there that you can take a look at. And I'll probably try to bring in some book recommendations next week. I'd need some time to sift through it. But there are definitely resources out there, and you should definitely check them out. And that's one of the issues that people have, right? Either they know that there are those resources out there for their own doubts. Maybe they've been struggling with the problem of evil. There are resources out there for their own doubts, but they either don't know that those resources exist, or they do know and just don't look into it, but they let that doubt fester in their minds. So I would highly recommend to look into those resources. There are tons of resources. It's been a, a thing that's been written on for thousands of years. And even today, there are tons of great apologists out there working on this problem. And I think there are many great solid answers for it too. There's also YouTube videos. If you don't want to buy a book, there are YouTube videos for it. Lots of great resources online. All right, so any final questions before we close this out? We took a look at external calling, and there are two types of external callings. We have vocatio realis, the call from nature. Just looking out, considering the things that God has made, you will see his deity and his power through that. Of course, people will reject and suppress the truth, of course. And you also have vocatio verbalis, the gospel calling where you've heard the gospel and you've been called in that way either perhaps supernaturally or from a preacher calling you for to repentance and so on and next week we'll take a look at the internal calling which is you know that internal calling where you it starts getting into your heart pretty much and we'll talk about regeneration in tandem with that not really the same thing, but most people say that they lead to the same thing. Regeneration is when you've been born again. And it's a work of God. But we'll, we'll get to that. One final thing I want to note real quick. One other difference between Calvinism and Arminianism. Actually, a couple differences. So this is our Ordo Salutis. Calling, regeneration, and then conversion. So this is the order that most Calvinists take, most Reformed people. But the order that some Armenians take is some people put regeneration first. Some people put justification first. and But most of the time, they switch regeneration and conversion. So if conversion includes faith and repentance, and if someone in their own natural free will or freed will can come to faith, can have faith in Jesus, then conversion would come first. And after they have faith, then they are regenerated by God. But they have to first come to God by either generating that faith in themselves or making use of the faith in some fashion. They have the final say to whether they are regenerated, whether they are saved or not. So that's one of the differences there. So again, you might disagree with the order of salvation that we've put forth here. This is the Reformed view. I agree with this, this order, but you might not, especially if you're an Armenian, and that's completely fine. That's completely fine. The only thing that we're doing here is we're just using this order as an outline for us so that we can actually talk in detail about all these different aspects of salvation. Whether you put conversion before regeneration or not, you, we can still talk about them in this particular order. All right. I guess there are no questions. So that was the summary of today, and anyone want us to close us out with a word of prayer? I guess I could guilt trip all of you with the horrible state of my poor raspy throat talkings for so long, <laughs> but I won't, though I kind of did already. <laughs> anyway, I'll, I'll pray for us then. Let's bow our heads in reverence. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you yet again for another wonderful day that you've given us. And thank you for everything that you've given us to the vocatio realis that we can look outside and see some of your invisible attributes, your wonderful claim and 
authority as deity and know that you are God. And that we can also see your ultimate power and your omnipotence in creating all of these things that are just beyond our imagination, our wildest dreams. Even though science continues on, we still haven't seen everything. And there's just so much out there. And thank you, Lord, for all of that. And also thank you for giving us preachers. And thank you for making us evangelists and calling us to witness to people and to make disciples of all nations and baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Holy Spirit and the Son. And thank you for giving us all these things, Lord. And I pray that we can always remember these things and always be grateful of everything that you've done for us. And I pray that we would not you know, let it all go to waste, that we would not neglect our salvation, that we would not neglect all of the great things that you've given us to provide for our salvation. And as we move on to next week, I thank you for the inner witness of the Holy Spirit and that effectual calling that you give us, or the ineffectual, non-effectual calling, I should say, if you're an Armenian. Either way, Lord, thank you for working in us and choosing to save some even though none of us deserve salvation and all of us actually deserve eternal condemnation. Thank you for giving us all these opportunities, Lord, and I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.